Hi, my name is Patrick Jacoda. I'm a professor of cinema and media studies and English at the University of Chicago. And I'm here at the Weston Game Lab, which is part of the Media Arts Data and Design Center here at the University of Chicago. And we create video games and board games about issues of social justice and science um, here, here at the lab. Um, but today I'm gonna to talk about a slightly different type of game that has a different relationship to the media sphere. Uh, to do that, I'm gonna share my screen um, and we'll start there. Um, so uh, this talk is gonna be called Transmedia Contagions and the genre or the form that I'm gonna be talking about is called the alternate reality game. So um, I imagine a number of you already know what alternate reality games are, but I'm gonna start by giving you a short overview and definition. So alternate reality games or ARGs can be understood provisionally as heavily mediated and narrative driven scavenger hunts that unfold both in physical space and online. And they have a few different features. So first of all, uh, these are transmedia experiences that are not limited by any single medium or platform. They can incorporate text, video, audio, phone calls, TikTok, Twitch, live performance, et cetera. They're like a very absorptive form. Second of all, their stories are broken into discrete pieces and players have to rediscover them and reconfigure them. Uh, third of all, these are never single player games. Uh, so the player networks of these games are participatory and collective. Uh, fourth of all, these games often have what is called a this is not a game aesthetic. So it's important to remember that alternate reality games always begin with what are called rabbit holes. So they don't announce themselves explicitly as games or as fictional narratives. And much of the gameplay has to do with making sense of the very experience in which one finds oneself. And this produces different forms of paranoia or apophenia, which is the ability to see patterns uh, where they might otherwise not exist. It's like a creative capacity. And then fifth of all, not always, but oftentimes these are long duration experiences. They last for several weeks and or several months. Um, to give you a very, very brief history before giving you some concrete cases, um, these games, in some ways, the, the genealogy of them can be traced back to the 1950s, uh, where you had members of the post-World War II avant-garde like John Cage or Nam June Paik, who were already experimenting with intermedia productions and with network thought. Um, then in the 1960s, you had the rise of conceptual art, performance art, and post-formalism um, uh, with artworks that privileged process to product. Um, so this would include things like cybernetic art, mail art, uh, or projects created by the Fluxus Collective. Um, by the 1980s and the 1990s, we saw the rise of network art, uh, including pieces created for print mail, fax, and satellite transmissions. And of course, network art in terms of like early internet art uh, was also practiced by practitioners such as Jody, uh, the cyber feminist uh, artists uh, like the BNS Matrix Collective, and tactical media groups like the Electronic Disturbance Theater. And so then ARGs really emerged as a networked art form. And you have examples such as The Beast, I Love Bees, and uh, the Nine Inch Nails game, uh, Year Zero, which are all coming out starting in the early 2000s. So this really is like a 21st century art form in many senses. And you know, another feature of this game is that it, it emerges in what we could talk about as a transmedia or convergence culture. That term convergence culture comes from Henry Jenkins, uh, who coined it, I think, in 2006. But transmedia as a broader term describes something that is other than multimedia, right? When we talk about a multimedia artwork, it's like a video game that happens on a single screen and, and incorporates text, video, audio elements, and so forth. Transmedia moves across different media, across different platforms, and calls our attention to the differences and the spaces uh, among those different media. So in addition to making video games and board games, I've been creating alternate reality games for many years. Uh, some of my earliest games uh, that I created very quickly and experimentally, though some of these lasted for many, many months, um, took up a number of different topics. So the, the Stork game took up 
issues of, of public health. Speculation was about uh, finance capital in the 2008 economic crisis uh, uh, and also Occupy Wall Street in the United States. Um, the source was about uh, underrepresented groups in STEM in the United States, for instance. So there were a number of different topics taken up here. And a lot of these games had live action components where people were physically in the same space for at least part of the performance. And part of it happened over websites and other places online. Then in 2017, uh, I co-founded something called the Forecast Lab, and with a number of collaborators in theater and performance studies, in media studies, in game design, in film production, uh, we created a series of games, including the Parasite and Terrarium. These are some images from those. And in fact, what I'll be doing for the rest of the talk is talking about two of these cases in greater detail, a labyrinth and echo, and then ending um, by uh, making some arguments, some analytical arguments that hopefully can connect to our live uh, connection. Um, and I'll argue for why I think these are, uh, this is one of the most important media forms of our time, even though it remains peripheral and certainly not as popular as, as video games. So part one, uh, a labyrinth. So this was an alternate reality game uh, that as you can see, uh, I co-designed uh, at the very beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we designed this largely in April and ran it in April and May of 2020. So we were responding to a very uncertain situation about which we had very little data, um, uh, very much in real time, which is part of the reason I wanted to raise this case um, for this particular conference about uh, contagions, visual and media contagions. So what was Labyrinth? Uh, it was an alternate reality game uh, that was intended to build community and foster play um, uh, during the pandemic. And it was also an experiment with live streaming platforms and with, with media storytelling. So because the pandemic was happening, we couldn't be in the same space. Zoom was still fairly new, even though we had had Skype and a number of live streaming platforms before that. So we wanted to create a proof of concept for how the humanities and the arts could respond quickly within a crisis. Uh, so to give you a sense of how many people played this game, we had about 3,500 people at the University of Chicago and around participating in the opening rabbit hole puzzle. Uh, we ended up having 73 core teams during the middle of the gameplay uh, and about 600 player participants through that entire period. Um, in four weeks, uh, we also had about 1,000 quests submitted. So as you'll see, we gave people quests, they created things, they sent them back to us, and then we put them on a leaderboard and moved them forward through this game. Um, but there was a, a huge amount of, of creative work that was happening during this uh, three or four week period. So to give you a sense of what this game looked like and felt like, um, I'm now gonna show you a very short trailer that we created. There's, there's a longer documentary uh, but I'll show you uh, just a few minute, two, two or three minute video of a labyrinth. I do think it's a lot of fun to just kind of be a little hammy. I was trying to connect it with different places, locations, people. I was screaming at my computer. It kind of just sounded like the most new Chicago thing out there to do. They would make a game for us all to play to keep us kind of sane. We believe games and stories can change the world. Our team name actually is Evicted Stoners. It's basically just a collection of people from Stony Island House who wanted to play the game. It helped keep me and our friend groups together. I don't think I would have talked to Nat at all unless <laughs> unless I had to play the game. They just did a great job because I can see, like, because this is a really hard time we're in, like, it's obviously bringing us together. We do have side quests, object quests, hub quests, and video quests. They're posted within like a connecting theme. Moving, making, playing, solving, world building, uh, and researching. There's kind of this Twitch type game going on. This video goes on and they'll pop up like 
an A, B, or C choice. So it becomes a game of where do you want to go as a group. My favorite thing has honestly been the riddles. They're so creative. For example, there have been things that I've been learning so much about different breads from different countries or braille or semaphore signaling language. I feel like my fun story is watching Andrew do his like TikToks. I'm still kind of learning how to understand the culture of it, but it's been really fun trying to mess around with it and make edits and fitting the themes of these quests. The idea is amazing, and then it's just being done so well. You can very much see like the love and passion, especially from my perspective. It's just really fun and amazing and phenomenal. <laughs> So that hopefully gives you a sense of what that game looked like and felt like. As you can see, we put it together very, very quickly, and I'll give you a sense of what some of those media components were. So the first thing was, uh, I won't go into the narrative very much, there was an overarching narrative, um, but structurally part of what we did is we gave players quests and uh, they completed those. There were 140 total quests that they could complete um, and they received points for completion and then sometimes bonus points for the quality of that submission. Um, and we didn't wanna make this game overly competitive, uh, but that was one of the driving forces to get people to create and share content with one another uh, in response to the pandemic. Um, along the way, we had many different kinds of quests. So one was to create a version of the Monopoly board game uh, that was organized around the Labyrinth game and the pandemic. So they reskinned something like the Monopoly game. Um, we also ha had them build labyrinths and mazes, which was one of the themes of, the, of this game um, within Minecraft. So we used other platforms in order to encourage um, kind of user generated content. Um, another quest had to do with creating a tarot card uh, that had something to do with the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, the hermit and the death card at that early moment in 2020 were probably the most common because people were isolated and also there was a fear of, of death or at least of serious illness. So that just gives you a few examples of the kinds of uh, audio visual things that people created. Videos were another part of this. Uh, pieces of writing were another kind of quest. Um, we also really drew on the resources that we had at the University of Chicago campus for this. So via Vimeo and YouTube, we created short videos from different faculty members uh, like my, my colleague, my former colleague, Lauren Berlant, uh, they created a, a quest about uh, their book, The Hundreds. Um, or Ju Julie Orlamansky, who's one of my colleagues in the English department, who's a medievalist, who created a quest um, about illuminated manuscripts. And basically said, create an illuminated manuscript that depicts the future of the University of Chicago in the year 2050. Uh, and people created, for instance, this is an example of an illuminated manuscript about climate refugees in the year 2050. So we were getting people to think about the future from within this very unique um, historical development of COVID-19. Um, and we did this with many other uh, professors at the university in a number of departments from media studies to medicine even. In addition to these very modular quests that allowed people to play this game at their own time, we also had unique live events. So we couldn't be in person, as I said, right? Um, there, were, there was no in-person play. So these are images from previous ARGs that I've created um, that in which we could actually have live theatrical events that happened all around campus where we could build live sets where we could have actors and costumes. Uh, that just wasn't the case because COVID was coming and we didn't quite know what the coordinates were yet. We knew we had to be isolated, we had to wear masks, but we didn't even know how contagious it was in, in March of 2020. Um, we also couldn't even, we didn't even have access to the costume space on campus. So it wasn't just about uh, keeping a distance, we couldn't even access our offices and existing archives. So uh, these images are from a 2019 game called Terrarium. And for that game, we could be in person. And so we could create really elaborate costumes for a game like this. Uh, but in this case, all of that was off the table. We knew the entire game had to take place online. 
Uh, and so the route that we decided to take was to pre-record body cam footage. And you saw that in the video of someone walking around with a body cam uh, around campus uh, and then inviting students to come in in a live way and interact with those actors through NetProv or networked improvisation. So the interface of the live event looked kind of like this. We did this on Twitch, which is a live streaming platform that is becoming more and more popular every year. Um, and the students could communicate with one another through chat. So you see the chat stream on the left side. Um, they would also at different moments get to vote about which way they wanted this character to go. So the main character of this game was the Tor, which was uh, short for Minotaur uh, from, the, uh, from Greek mythology, of course. And we turned all of the University of Chicago campus, which was empty at that point, into a kind of labyrinth. And players had to go different places, find objects, find treasures, locate quests, and they would get to do this once a week. So they would get one hour in the labyrinth every week that would unearth new, new uh, quests. And they would see a version of the campus that was distorted, right? That we, we used all kinds of uh, glitch effects on to defamiliarize it. We gave it a different filter, for instance. And uh, within that space, uh, they both were connecting to a space that they were away from because by this time, most of the students had been sent home and so were disconnected from their, their university. Uh, but they also saw this slightly science fictional space. And as they moved through it, they unlocked all of these new quests like telephone tennis or static cycle or gamer grub. So it had this kind of alliterative uh, wordplay. Um, so anyway, this gives you a sense of not the entirety of the game because I don't have that much time but it gives you a sense of some of the key components of this game. The second game that we ran uh, later that year in September and October of 2020 was called Echo. Um, to give you a sense of the schedule, this game started in late September and ran through late October. Uh, it started with a viral rabbit hole on Instagram. So if you wanna see what those videos look like, you could go to Biblio Regina on Instagram. And it was about a bunch of weird events happening um, um, basically on, uh, like in the library, which was abandoned at the University of Chicago, but we got a special dispensation to shoot, shoot footage and do stuff with that footage within the library. Um, after that, we sent all of the players to a puzzle online. It took them about 36 hours to solve that puzzle together. Uh, it was a Spotify puzzle with a series of Spotify playlists that spelled out a password. That password opened up a website and that website allowed them to sign up for teams, which they did. And we, we had hundreds of players playing this game again. Um, and then finally, all of this culminated on October 30th with a finale. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but basically for about an hour and a half, um, a group of people of a few hundred people was split among three different live streaming rooms. And in each of those, those rooms, they had to solve different challenges and puzzles in order to bring back information to the overall group and, and solve the overall puzzle. Um, and this game had to do with an echo universe that was identical to our own, except COVID-19 hadn't happened there. So there was this one major historical change. So again, I'll show you a very short video, two minutes long, uh, to give you a sense of what this game looked like and felt like. This is not a game. Echo is an alternate reality game to engage around the health pact. Using a science fiction narrative to creatively approach COVID. 600 students, staff members, faculty members, even medical students sign up for the game. I'm Scarlett, we don't have much time. Echo culminated in a live online performance one 90-minute block of challenges and puzzles and storytelling. We built a platform for running that performance. Live streaming video, chat, interactive puzzles. And all of those elements are sort of then suspended inside a seamless experience. Players went to a place and anything could happen. We knew what was going to happen, but we didn't know what was going to happen. This, this is like a Christopher Nolan film that you had to try to catch up and piece together the parts. Echo is fun. The quest got me and my teammates connected. It was like a breath of fresh air for these three weeks. 
I think we learned a lot about each other as well. The challenges, the effort, bringing together just a lot of different groups was tremendous. Okay. So that gives you, again, an overview sense of what this game might have felt like. People were still playing it from a distance, but we were able to introduce more costumes, more characters, more elements of live streaming. Um, as with the Elaborant game, we had a number of quest types, and I won't go through all of these, but they were even more COVID-19 specific, because at this point, we had a much clearer sense of what healthy behaviors uh, might look like. And some of them were very COVID-19 specific, like the first one, the second one had more to do with uh, connecting people uh, across a community um, to think about mental health, to think, think about social connection as well. So you can read through those if you're interested in the quest types. Um, but uh, people did stuff like creating uh, artistic COVID-19 masks. This is one example uh, that I particularly liked. Uh, but again, there were hundreds of quests that were submitted. People instantly connected online, uh, especially through the Twitch platform and through our, our website and started creating things in teams. Um, the other key element of this that was a little bit different was that 90 minute block at the very end where we were playing with something like live performance and game making from a distance. And here, this is just a shot of, of me and a few of, of my collaborators uh, who are running this live session. So this was actually from the live session. And as players were making different kinds of decisions in real time, we had to play back. We had to improvise. Um, not everything was uh, predetermined, which was part of what was so exciting about this form. And during this part of the game, we had, as I said, three different rooms. There was a puzzle room uh, where they would get riddles and have to like collectively solve words. So a dish that uses an egg. Um, the answer to this was custard. And in the second part of this puzzle, they had to actually type in custard, but each group of players would have access to only one of the letter uh, positions. And so they had to really cooperate and coordinate um, to get that word done. Another room was the magic room. And we hired a professional magician who created Zoom specific tricks. And through these tricks was able to incorporate unique things about the players uh, which yielded information that they could bring back uh, to the main narrative. And then finally, there was a story room where people had a chance to reflect on what was difficult about COVID, what was difficult about the pandemic for their families, for their friends, uh, for their lives. Um, and once these three rooms were done, everybody came back to a central space and had to vote on a number of different narrative question. So if you could personally explore any other world, what kind of world would you choose? Is a question that the other echo world asked of us. And people got to choose between dystopian, utopian, past and future worlds. And that determined some of what happened at the, the very end of the game. Um, so that gives you a little bit of a sense of how transmedia these experiences can be. So part three, from alternate reality games to media concepts. And I'll end with this. So part of the reason that I make alternate reality games is yes, I'm a practitioner, I'm a designer, but I'm also a theorist. Uh, I'm also an editor uh, for Critical Inquiry, for instance, and I write uh, theory books. And for me, making these games helps me think in terms of media theory in new ways. So I wanna make three quick arguments. The first one is that I see alternate reality games as the paradigmatic form of the 21st century. Um, in the late 20th century, we've seen a decline and a transformation of previous art forms like film. Film certainly has seen a little bit of a decline because of the loss of theaters during COVID-19 worldwide. The profits have just like dropped precipitously. Um, but also even before that, we were seeing a slight decline in film and a rise in the video game industry, quite a dramatic rise. I mean, this is a multi, multi-billion dollar industry. Um, but even beyond money, video games are interesting from a cultural perspective and an economic perspective. So video games started to become popular in the 1970s, which was the same time that neoliberalism as a worldview, as an economic and social system uh, started its rise. Uh, and this is actually an argument that I make in much more detail in my book, Experimental Games, which is pictured here. So I won't go into it in very much detail. But I see video games as enabling experiments with life in a moment that is increasingly characterized by digital media, deep learning algorithms, and telecommunication networks. 
Um, so in addition to being symptomatic of some aspects of neoliberal capitalism, uh, video games in particular have also resonated with that world and therefore given us a different kind of access into it. Whereas film was so well aligned with the broadcast model of the 20th century, video games are aligned with the point casting model of the 21st century. Um, they, they align much closely with AI and uh, telecommunication networks and therefore help us think about them. But beyond video games in particular, I would argue that alternate reality games are even more exemplary of our contemporary moment, right? People integrate apps like Twitch, Discord, TikTok into their everyday lives. And that's exactly the kinds of platforms that ARGs utilize toward different purposes. Also these games, I didn't talk a lot about this, but these games also have a, this is not a game aesthetic. So they, don't announce themselves officially as games. And that resonates really closely with the post-truth dimensions of our political and media spheres. This can be very dangerous. We see this with QAnon in the United States, which basically works kind of like a game, even though um, that fringe group takes itself very seriously, uh, but it adopts elements of ARGs. Um, but I'm actually interested in ARGs as a way of helping us uh, push against these post-truth systems and giving us a different kind of critical distance to think about them. My second argument is I see alternate reality games as a form of media flailing. So Lauren Berlant has this concept of genre flailing, right? She argues that, as the quote says here, genre flailing is a mode of crisis management that arises after an object or object world becomes disturbed in a way that includes un uh, intrudes on one's confidence about how to move in it. We genre flail so that we don't fall through the cracks of heightened affective noise into despair, suicide, or psychosis. So an example would be Spike Lee's film, uh, Chirac, which moves across different genres. And it's grappling with the problem of uh, violence in major urban areas like the South side of Chicago and um, about structural inequality in the United States. And this is such a huge problem that one genre couldn't give you access into it. So it flails across many different genres in an, in an attempt to say something about this very difficult topic. And so similarly, ARGs can genre flail, but they also media flail. Um, so they offer an affective response to an emergent crisis via digital and networked media. So COVID-19 as a pandemic was both an epidemiological crisis and a media crisis, right? It was a crisis from the standpoint of the virus itself, but also a question of like, how do we organize our time? How do we connect to one another? Does work happen online? How does that happen? Um, how do we stave off uh, depression and many other problems um, while uh, sitting in front of screens all the time? Um, and ARGs give us a different access to those questions. Uh, therefore, I see them less as games than as transmedia platforms that direct attention to the interplay of media. Um, they help us think about what is so essential, so much at the core of our media lives in the year 20. 21. And they do that partially through the very jagged and fragmented movement among platforms. They don't try to give you a smooth experience. They give you one that calls attention to the gaps and the sutures between different media. And then finally, I think of ARGs as moving us uh, from representation to improvisation. So there are many games, for example, that represent pandemics. Pandemic, the board game, is, is a very obvious example of that. That's fine. Representation isn't a bad thing. But a labyrinth and echo, the cases that I talked about, ask us, uh, what does it mean to improvise in response to and from within a pandemic? Right. Rather than just trying to represent a pandemic, what does it mean to actually grapple with the historical present from within that present? Um, and to do that, again, we engaged in collective netprov, collective net, network improvisation beyond what most video games are capable of. Certainly improvisation happens in multiplayer games and open world video games, but we, we had a tightness between designers and players that most video games don't have. So when players were live and interacting with actors, I could come in um, as a netprov actor, for instance, or, or a number of my colleagues could as well, like Heidi Coleman, and um, could add things to the narrative that had never been planned before. And we were able to change the narrative in very fundamental ways um, in order to um, 
to create a different kind of experience for the players. So I'm suggesting here that ARGs offer alternative forms of contagion, not of virality, but of ways of affecting people with a different sense of possibility because they're able to contribute to narratives in ways that maybe previously they weren't. Um, in any case, I'm gonna stop there and I'm happy to uh, talk more about this during our live session, which I'm excited that we're still going to have. But I hope that gives us some shared coordinates. Um, and if you want to see uh, more of the work that we do and more of the longer documentaries, we have those uh, at the Forecast Lab. Forecast is spelled like the number four, F-O-U-R, CAST Lab. Um, and you can find those videos online. Um, thank you so much.